thanks a lot for joining us today. So um, thanks for joining our panel discussion today on gendered cities. Uh, my name is Mara Nogueira and I'm an urban geography lecturer uh, at Burbank in the geography department. And it's my pleasure to be chairing this event tonight on gendered cities. Uh, this event has been uh, on the making for a long time. It was supposed to happen in late March uh, in the physical world, but then the pandemic hit us and unfortunately we had to cancel um, the, the, the event, but um, uh, we were able to reschedule it and to host it online. And um, for that reason, I suppose some of you that wouldn't be able to attend uh, the original event uh, can join us today. So welcome to all of you, a uh, special welcome to our speakers tonight, uh, Professor Sanjay Srivastava and uh, Professor Rosie Cox, who will be speaking to you in a minute. So, um, um, so Professor Sanjay, uh, I'll introduce them more uh, in a second, um, is a professor of sociology in the Delhi University North, North Campus. And professor, and also a British Academy Global Professor hosted currently at, at UCL. Uh, professor Rosie Cox is, is my colleague uh, in the Department of Geography in Birkbeck. She's a professor of geography, and they are both um, um, experts uh, on uh, the debate that we are going to have today uh, on the gender aspects of, of urban spaces. Uh, so um, before uh, I move on, uh, and introduce a bit more of the event itself and, and, and talk a bit about the, the speakers that we have today. Uh, I would like to also say that the event tonight is the launch of our new master's uh, program at Birkbeck, which is uh, the CITES uh, program that is going to uh, start for the first time uh, beginning in October. And uh, we are very excited about this new CITES program. I'm the program director, and um, we have our applications open. And it's a very exciting new program, which is transdisciplinary and brings uh, uh, together researchers from both uh, the School of Arts and, and the School of Social Sciences and to talk about cities and, and the, the, the problems that uh, our cities are facing, which I think um, uh, we have really here a challenge nowadays in a world that is urbanized and urbanizing fast, which faces challenges such as uh, climate change, but also the crisis of labor markets, uh, the global pandemic that we are facing right now, and 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 uh, cities disproportionately, uh, but also social inequalities that are persistent and are being revealed. Uh, uh, by this um, crisis as well. And one of the social inequalities, obviously, in regards to gender and the relations between gender, class, race, and et cetera, which is the topic of, of, our, of, our, of our talk today. So the CITES program then uh, is an opportunity for us to reflect uh, on those challenges uh, and think about those challenges from uh, multiple disciplines. And it's a unique approach that has together uh, the several departments in our School of Social Sciences, but also uh, the departments in the School of Arts to think about cities and to think about creative ways of addressing the challenges that urban spaces are, are facing nowadays. Um, so these are some of the departments which are involved. Uh, obviously, the geography department uh, uh, is involved. It's the, it's the home of the program, but the Department of History, of Politics, of uh, Humanities, English and Humanities, Media and Cultural Studies, History of Art, and, and many others are also involved in this program. Here are some of the faces that, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, some of the academics uh, which are also part of the program. So myself, obviously, Melissa Butcher and Paul and, um, and Andrea in the Geography Department. Uh, Jack Liu in the Applied Linguistics and Communications Department, Scott Rogers, Mike Crimson, uh, Joanne, Matthew Davis, and Ben Gidley. So these are just a few of the of the experts that we have uh, together in this program, and we are really kind of looking forward to 
to such an interdisciplinary uh, uh, program that will really kind of bring a unique way of looking uh, at cities and bring together uh, such a diverse team of, of, of experts to think about cities and to, and to uh, teach about cities. Um, so uh, that said, I, I would say that uh, the event tonight is a bit of um, 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 a sneak peek on the kinds of approaches that uh, we are interested in in this program. So we have uh, Professor Sanjay and Professor Rosie. Prof uh, Rosie come from geography, Sanjay coming from sociology, and then uh, how those two disciplines then can help us understand the ways uh, in which uh, cities are reproduced by uh, by gender norms and also uh, how gender norms are reproduced by by urban spaces so uh, again uh, thank you very much for joining uh, me today uh, I'd like to just before I forget really to thank William and Anna uh, and Jennifer from the events officer department at Birkbeck who have been a huge help in putting this event together and have put up with all the changes that had to be made uh, from the cancel uh, from the cancellation to the move of the event from the physical to the to the online world. Uh, so thank you very much. And and um, so uh, now I'm gonna just um, um, uh, give the word to our speakers. Uh, I'll start uh, with Professor uh, Sanjay Shivastava who is, as I said, a professor of sociology at the Institute of Economic Growth at the Delhi University North Campus. Uh, he's also currently based at UCL as a British Academy Global Professor. Uh, a bit about uh, Sanjay's biography, he is an anthropologist uh, whose work spans over themes of masculinities and sexualities, new urbanism in India, gender and globalization, consumerism and middle class cultures, and social theory. He has published several books, including uh, a co-edited book entitled Histories of Desire, Sexualities and Culture in Modern India, which has been published uh, in 2019 by uh, Cambridge University Press. Um, his talk uh, for tonight will focus on uh, the politics of protest in leisure, gender, urban spaces, and the making of, uh, of new publics in India. So the way this is going to work, I'm going to give Sanjay the, 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 uh, the, the word now. Uh, he's going to present uh, a bit of his research for us for the, for the 15 minutes. Uh, then I'll introduce uh, Professor Rosie. She's going to talk about, for, um, about her research um, for us for about 15 minutes as well. And then we are going to open for, for um, uh, questions. So um, uh, when that time comes, I'll just indicate how you, you ask questions. But you can see on your right there is a chat. And that way you can type uh, your questions when, when the time comes. So without further you uh, um, uh, welcome um, Sanjay and thanks for joining. So um, the, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to speak for about 15 minutes on um, or rather explore the uh, relationship between gender uh, and urban life in India through thinking about uh, religiosity, religious division and class and specifically, uh, the, the larger background is a series of protests that, that have been happening in Delhi. And I, I want to sort of um, position that alongside um, other places where um, women have been visible. So the protests that I'm talking to you about um, have been marked by the fact that women of a particular religious community have been very visible. And the, the other context that I want to uh, direct your attention to is a different class context. Um, in order to think about what class and gender and city mean in a, in a society which is undergoing rapid urbanization. So very quickly, then I'll give you the, the, the two case studies and then just pointers. And there are no definitive conclusions, but just some speculative comments about what is happening in a society which is rapidly and undergoing kind of rapid urbanization. So some of you may have been reading about a locality called Shaheen Bagh in East Delhi. Um, where uh, from um, the 15th of December till the um, 24th of March, there was a, a, a massive sitting pro protests. Shaheen Bagh in East Delhi is, um, is a lower in what's referred to as a relatively poor locality. It's largely a predominantly a Muslim locality. And the protests were particularly interesting because 
the most significant uh, faces of the protest were women, Muslim women. Quite often, Muslim Muslim women in full burqa, in obviously very obviously uh, religious uh, uh, clothing. The protest, just to give you some a very quick um, uh, background, had to do with um, the government. The government of India in December passed an act called the Citizenship Amendment Act, um, which is uh, which is itself an amendment of the Citizenship Act in 1955. The current amendment uh, allowed um, uh, um, uh, certain religious groups, Hindus, Parsis, Jains, Sikhs, uh, and Christians from Bangladesh, Afghanistan, uh, uh, and, and Pakistan, to, who have come to India before 2014 to have a quick route to citizenship. It did not mention Muslims who might also be suffering, who might be suffering some form of religious persecution in these countries. So the act, the, the CAA, the Citizenship Amendment Act, which was passed by the Indian Parliament in December last year, was seen as anti-Muslim. And the women um, who were protesting as Shaheen Bagh uh, were protesting against this particular amendment. Now, Shaheen Bagh, as I said, is a predominantly Muslim locality. Um, it, it, is, it was, and as far as the media was concerned, and general observers were concerned, it was an extraordinarily unusual thing to see women in public spaces in a city like Delhi, which, um, again, if you've been following events in, in, in Delhi, in Delhi, then you, you, would, you would be aware of some of the discourse around gender and citizenship and the idea of women's presence in the, in the particular city. Um, now, the, that, that, that's a particular context. Now, and I'll just go through some of my slides just to give you some sense of what the protest side itself looked uh, look like. This is just a general shot right in the middle of a, of a main thoroughfare protesters had blocked the thoroughfare and blocking traffic from all sides. From all sides. Um, so as you can see, uh, the, the very significant uh, presence of women dressed in obviously religious garb um, and uh, women holding up uh, 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 signs protesting, saying that uh, we, we want to be free, we protest against a particular amendment. It is discriminatory, etc. And these are some of the photographs that I took when I was there early this year. Um, prided, uh, predominantly women, and they were the most visible protests of uh, a visible face of the particular protests. Uh, this particular protest. Um, Shaheen Bagh, uh, just to re to emphasize, is a poor locality. It's it used it was used to be farmlands, and then someone owned the farmlands, divided it up sold it to people who could not buy, afford to buy in other parts of Delhi. And so the built is a very hazard locality. There are sort of naked wires everywhere, streets winding, uh, um, uh, sort of choked with traffic, et cetera, et cetera. It's a, it's a, it's a very typical particular kind of Delhi locality. So just that, that, that's one kind of presence of women in Delhi. Let me just quickly go on to the other one in order to come back to some of the points that I want to make. Um, the, one of, one, one of the many things that's happened in a place like Delhi is the opening up of certain kinds of spaces of leisure. This is a temple complex in, on, the, on the banks of the river Yamuna in Delhi called the Akshardham Temple. Now, the Akshardham Temple complex belongs to a very famous global sect of Hindus, the Swaminarayan sect. And perhaps some of you here in London, who live in London, have been to um, the, uh, the Akshardham Temple in Neesden, I think in northwest London. It's become the kind of the global face of Hinduism. The Akshatam Temple is a very high-tech temple in Delhi. It has a, it has um, an anemetric show which depicts the life of the founder. Uh, the, 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 the movement itself founded in, nine, in the late 18th century. So you pay for these, uh, you know, this particular uh, editions. Uh, so it's an anemetric show where the robotic displays where figures get up and, and you know uh, and show the apparent the uh, the life of the founder and the philosophy of the Swami Narayan movement. These are some of the uh, uh, photographs. I wasn't able to take any photographs because they're not allowed to take any camera inside the particular complex. Complex. It's it's a very high tech complex. You enter through these what are sort of a corporate five star hotel lobby uh, kind of uh, things. That you enter the temple complex. Uh, temple is in the is, is of course in the middle, which is what it looks like. But it's it's it um, but it's surrounded by a whole range of activities. And it's uh, the temple itself was based, and the complex itself was 
based on the uh, the model of, uh, of of Universal Studios. So there is, um, as I say, a robotics display, animatrix. There's a there's a there's a boat ride through what is referred to as 10,000 years of um, of Indian, that is Hindu civilization, where you sort of ride on this boat and both sides see these displays of what are supposed to be the achievements of Indian civilization. Um, so that's one particular uh, space of leisure. One of the most significant things when you visit this temple, temple complex is the presence of women. Uh, women singly, women in all women groups, um, which is again a very unusual thing for a place like Delhi. So that's, that, that's uh, but of course the women here are largely Hindu women. Okay. Now the final context that I want to direct your attention to before I come back to making some comments about um, uh, gender, urbanization, and class, and religion is that, of course, in India, as in many other cities in the global south, the growth of gated communities has been a really significant urban development. In India, for example, there are 300 cities that now have gated communities. And one of the most significant aspects of gated communities is the growth of religiosity. So in large numbers of gated communities, you have an efflorescence, a kind of a rise of religious activities particularly religious activities where women take part. So there are many women-centered Hindu rituals and gated communities are now full of women taking part in these rituals. This is one particular one. It's referred to as Karwa Chot. It's where women um, pray for the health of the men in the family. Okay. Now, so I want to now just go back to making some quick comments before I, and to conclude. Is it, how do we think about these particular aspects? Um, now, I want to uh, so, uh, then begin with uh, the aspect of class. I think what has happened in, in cities in the global south, and certainly, I, well, I shouldn't generalize, particularly in the Indian context and South Asia, is that increasingly you find that middle class Hindu women retreat to cloistered, cloistered spaces, such as uh, spaces of leisure. And their engagement with the world has increasingly become to what I want to refer to as modern consumption. So while they are present in public spaces um, and they are present in, in context of consumerism, and you have uh, Indian cities are, are largely being designed as uh, cities of consumerism, their acts of consumerism, which go side by side with acts of public presence, is through notions of moral consumption. That is, consumerism makes you a public person, a public woman, and yet consumerism is also something that, that is about um, a certain sense of autonomy, but that is to be, to be tempered through associating consumerism through act tradition religiosity. So Akshadhan Temple, the Akshadhan Temple complex is a complex where women are consumers. There's a, there's a, you know, there's in fact a shop where you can buy souvenirs. You have baseball caps with Akshadhan written and you can buy all kinds of souvenirs with temple uh, models of the temple, etc. And the, in the same space, however, you move between being a consumer, a hyper-consumer, but also being a very traditional woman. So you move backwards and forwards. So it's, so it's a particular kind of autonomy that is determined by the space that consumerism creates in a city like Delhi. This is for a specific class of women, and this is also for uh, Hindu women. So one, cont one context I want to suggest to you is your moral consumption which refers to class, which refers to, to a particular religion, and which refers to the notion that women should be consumers, but they should be moral consumers. However, at Shaheen Bad, it's ironic that you have overtly religious women, or women who are at least identified in the media as religion, as religious, um, protesting in favor of defending what in India are known as secular values. That is, they're specifically defending constitutional values, saying that as the Indian constitution says that, um, that you cannot discriminate on the grounds of religion, whereas the Citizenship Amendment Act specifically is interpreted as discriminating on the grounds of religion. So you might think of it as the making of a new, of new Muslim identities in terms of gender, and also in terms of negotiation happening um, in a city like Delhi, in Muslim households, in order for women in to present themselves night after night. And you have to remember, these are 24-hour protests. Women were there during the day. They were there throughout the night. So negotiations within the household in terms of being present in, the, in, in, in a public space. Whereas, ironically, um, for, for Hindu women and who are identified as not as overtly 
which is as Muslims, it is the, the their presence in public spaces has become increasingly embedded within a religious context. However, I want to say something else that the that that the their presence is in privately created public spaces, such as gated communities, such as the Akshadhan temple complex, where the presence of Muslim women um, is in the street. So there's been a retreat, I think, in terms of uh, the urban context in India by the middle classes, by the dominant middle classes, which are the Hindu middle classes, from the street to private spaces. Now, how then should we think about the making of new publics in the global south? How to, so the question really is how to insert religious and gender identities in societies experiencing a rapid urbanization and the change that comes with it. With it. But also um, within that rapid, uh, rapid urbanization, there's a continuing hold of all the social structures. How do you think about this? Um, how do we think about, for example, the religion, the relationship between religiosity and urban life? Is it a straightforward secularization as we think of in terms of, of, of organization? or the remaking of religious beliefs. Um, now, it's really, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to offer an, uh, any definitive conclusion, except to point to the predictory ways in which urban processes and spaces produce and direct identities, and specifically how we might think about the relationship between class and urban space, class, religion, and gender in urban space, and class, religion, gender in urban space in societies that are experiencing rapid urbanization. So I just wanted to throw some of these questions at you without necessarily giving you a definitive answer. And I'd be happy to have a discussion. With you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanjay. Um, I think we uh, certainly will have time for questions uh, after this. And I, for one, have, have quite a few questions to ask you, but I'll hold on to them until the end. Uh, so now I'd like to uh, uh, pass the word to, to, to my colleague, Professor uh, Jose Koch, who's a professor of geography at the Department of Geography at Birkbeck. Um, uh, professor Rose's research focuses on gender, reproductive work, and inequalities within homes. Uh, so I think a good compliment to Sanjay's talk as well. She has been research, paid domestic workers and all pairs in London for over 20 years. And her most recent project examines the commoditization of male gardeners, uh, male reproductive labor in the home and employment of handymen and gardeners. So uh, the, the, the title of her talk this evening is Migration and Reproductive Labor in the Global City the experiences of all pairs in London. Thank you very much, Rosie, and, and welcome. I um, feel a bit bad to be talking about something which is not so up to date. I'm actually going to be reflecting on work which is a few years old now, and thinking about people in the city seems so strange when we can't move around in the way that we did. And um, also, I'm going to be talking about migration to London by people from um, European countries before the Brexit referendum. So it feels kind of out of place in a few ways. But the points I want to make about reproductive labour and what it means to be, to be doing gender in the global city, I think we can think about the other context in which they might work. So what I want to do today is to look at two sides of the gendered city, two sides of the coin of reproductive labour, paid reproductive labour. The um, low-wage migrant labour who are drawn in to carry out domestic and childcare work and the way that the city creates a particular demand for that labour within the families who host them. I'm going to be looking at the lives of au pairs and how their dreams of excitement being in the big city meet with the demands of the host families that they live with who need long hours of care work from them. London is a really important destination for au pairs and definitely was before the Brexit referendum. And au pairs, like many other young migrants, are attracted by the social, cultural and economic opportunities that the city offers or that they imagine that it offers. And London also has a really strong demand for au pair labour. And this is shaped, and I'll talk about this in more detail, by the 
childcare regimes and working practices that have made home-based, privatised childcare popular with many families, and also a migration regime, which includes deregulation of au pairing, which has funneled migrants into low-paid domestic and caring work. So I'm going to look at how au pairs' perceptions of London operate in the favour of the host families that they live with, because we found that au pairs will accept poor pay and poor working conditions in order to be located in London. Within the context of deregulation, which I'll explain a bit more, au pairs have traded good conditions for the chance to be in the capital. The work I'm going to talk to you about today is a project that was done with au pairs and host families that was carried out between 2012 and 2014. So it's nothing like um, as up to date as the work we've just been hearing about. But this was a really important time because it was after the global financial crisis, um, but when the effects of that were still really prominent in other parts of Europe, particularly in Spain, which sends a lot of au pairs. But before the Brexit, referendum when au pairing was really booming in the UK and the UK was seen as a particularly desirable destination. So you might be thinking, what are au pairs? Why, why is this person talking about these things? So au pairs provide a particular kind of domestic work. They're technically not workers. They're always meant to be migrants. They're generally young and about 18 to 30 years old. They're overwhelmingly female. They live with people who are called their host family, who we think of as their employers, but technically they're not employers. And they carry out childcare and what is described as light housework, which nobody ever really knows what that is. In exchange for this, they earn what is called pocket money. It's not called wages. And they're meant to be given a free place to live, a room in the host family's house and all their meals. They're not classified legally as workers or as employed. They have no rights to the national minimum wage and they have absolutely no protections under employment law. So there are no limits on the number of hours they can be asked to work. They're not covered by the 48 hour maximum. They have no particular right to any amount of holiday during the year. They could be asked to work 52 weeks of the year. And, you know, there are no, uh, they're not covered by, for example, health and safety protections. In the UK, most au pairs are EEA nationals, so they come from EU and EEA countries. And they come to this country under freedom of movement rules of will do until the end of this year. And nobody has to trace the fact that they're moving. There are no records whatsoever kept of au pairs leaving and entering the country or leaving and entering au pair posts. There are no official figures collected about them, no records of where they are. And so we know very little about them. But it was estimated that um, before the um, referendum to, um, for the UK to um, leave the EU, there were probably 90 to 100,000 au pairs in the country at any time. And that was probably stable for the best part of 10 years. So that's who au pairs are and what they do. One of the things that's really important for understanding why au pairs are in this situation is that in the UK, we have one of the least regulated but most popular au pair schemes. Um, so in some other countries, au pairing is actually regulated by government. So au pairs might have visas or they might have to register, they might have to have a particular contract. But in the UK, none of that is true. The, the government exerts almost zero influence over the sector. And what that means in the context of the UK and particularly London being very, very popular is that the number of au pairs available to do any job can be very high. So we have a, um, a total deregulation of the sector on, on one side and an oversupply of au pairs on the other side. Um, this means that au pairs are totally at the whim of market forces and their experiences and placements is really variable from absolutely great, totally what they were looking for, to really exploited and in the very, very worst situation, 
there was no pair very brutally murdered by the family that she was living with about a year and a half ago. So to understand a bit more about how the two parts of the global city come together, I'm going to look at the particular things that happen in London that create demand for this form of social reproduction. London can be thought of as kind of really encapsulating an extreme example of the broader way that the UK, UK care regime exists. One thing that's really important is in the UK, different to say the Nordic countries, we have a, what's called a care regime, which has been characterized as favoring mother-like care. That is that care in the home is favored over care in, for example, nursery settings. And there's relatively little state support compared to a lot of Northern European countries um, for any kind of childcare. There's also an expectation that families, which basically means mothers in most cases, are individually responsible for finding market-based solutions or other private solutions to their childcare needs. But at the same time, the UK has high rates of labour force participation for women with children. That is, mothers, even with very small children, are very likely to go out to work. About 80% of women with children aged four to 10 years who lived in a couple were in paid employment in the UK um, in the last decade. Compared to the Nordic countries at least, there were also very limited expectations on men to participate equally in reproductive labor, particularly in terms of sacrificing hours worked to perform childcare. And one outcome of this is demand very high demand for privatised forms of childcare, such as nannies and au pairs. In London, this is added to by the fact that there are very few other alternatives. Working parents are faced with a real shortage of nursery places and exceptionally high costs. On average, a nursery place for a small child in the UK is about 30% higher than the, the rest of the country. And in affluent areas, this could cost up to £22,000 per year per child. The particular expense and pressures of working in the capital have also conspired to make nurseries, so those group settings, a much less attractive and viable childcare option for many families. These pressures include things like very long commute times because of the centralised nature of work, particularly middle class jobs relative to the rest of Europe, I'm thinking here. The UK also has relatively long working hours compared to its neighbours and very high and actual increasing demands for flexibility for employers. All of these make it very difficult to fit work around any kind of limitation or any lack of flexibility in childcare, such as those that a nursery would offer. It's very difficult for a parent to work long hours at work and do a commute and get their child back from nursery on time. And unlike a nursery, um, an au pair will be there if you're late home from work. <clears throat> nursery workers aren't going to stay late if you're suddenly required to work late or if you have trouble with public transport disruptions, but an au pair is going to be there. London also has what's described, it has a high number of professional households which are described as being without a wife than the national average. That means is that two people work quite long hours. This means that for many households, nursery is going to be much less attractive than hiring an au pair, who not only is going to provide that kind of flexible childcare for children, but they're also going to do some housework, maybe pick up the dry cleaning, shop for groceries, and put on a load of washing whilst they're doing all of everything else. Then this need, this demand for childcare has been backed up by an approach to migration, which has allowed, um, until, the, until Brexit, um, a lot of low-wage labour to enter the country from other European countries, and that was a deliberate um, act on the part of government. So while some of the migrants who are in London are, you know, the great and the good of financial institutions, Migrants in London are actually found doing the lowest paid job, generally 
um, in dirty and unpleasant situations and very much in labour intensive jobs and in personal services. Um, I've put on this slide, migrant workers typically earn 40% less than the average Londoner and newly arrived migrants from A8 countries, so those are the eight European, eight Eastern European countries that joined the EU in 2004, um, well, got free, well, yeah, they joined and got freedom of movement. But those are the people whose earnings are the lowest and they are um, generally earning around national minimum wage. And the supply of this low waged migrant labour has created a market for services that otherwise perhaps wouldn't have existed. So families might have had to make different arrangements, um, maybe by doing that work themselves or relying on other family members. But now with this supply of low wage labour, they're able to actually employ somebody to do this reproductive work. So then that meets this supply of au pairs. Where, why, do, why do people want to come? Um, and how has that reshaped labour markets? What we find is that the flow of migrants to London has reshaped labour markets which demand lots of people doing relatively low wage labour. And they've helped to produce a city which is diverse, it's dynamic, and actually it's relatively welcoming to outsiders. And I do caveat that with relatively. And these activities make it still more attractive to people who want to migrate. For some groups of migrants, particularly younger people from relatively wealthy countries, such as the rest of Europe, London can be a really attractive destination because of the opportunities that it offers for cultural encounters, for self-discovery, as well as the, e the economic opportunities that, that might be here. And au pairs, for the most part, are amongst this group. Um, and the period before Brexit saw 10,000 of au pairs come to London each year, with some au pair posts that were advertised attracting regularly hundreds, or even in one case, 3,000 applications for just one au pair post that wasn't particularly exceptional. And because au pairing in the UK is so unregulated, the outcome of this oversupply has been the, an expansion of the au pair role with au pairs being expected to work long hours, to care for small babies, which is something which in the past was only done by qualified nannies, or to do maybe just keeping specialist care for children with special needs, things that they wouldn't necessarily have been expected to do before. As part of our study, we did analysis of adverts for au pairs on the Gumtree website, and we found that although au pairing is a part-time job, when there was a visa, au pairs weren't allowed to work more than 25 a week. Under the deregulated conditions, au pairs on average were working nearly full-time, 38, well, full-time, 38.7 hours a week. Some of the posts offered no pocket money whatsoever. By law, they don't have to. And there were posts being advertised, which would live out. So an au pair was expected to find somewhere to live for herself. Whereas living in has really is meant to characterise au pair as being part of a family. 44% of the ads that we saw said that experience was important necessary. And this suggested that people were looking for really a proper um, skilled childcare worker, not somebody who was just exchanging a bit of labour for the chance to be part of a family in London. We also carried out interviews with au pairs and with host families, and we asked the au pairs why they had come to London. Generally, they perceived London to be exciting, tolerant, and sometimes very different from where they came from at home. Uh, when asked what was good about London, one au pair, um, Anna, said to us, London is incredible and amazing. Um, London occurred again and again in interviews when au pairs were asked what a positive aspect of their experience was. And I've got here a couple of quotes from an au pair called, with, that I'm calling Rachel, who is from Germany. And she explained her desire to live in London had been brewing for years. So she told us, I really wanted to go to London and the agency only had a few families around Oxford and stuff like that. 
I said, no, I have to go to London because when I was 13 years old, I was only for a day here. And it's like, when I'm 18, I'm moving here. So on my 18th birthday, just a week after that, I moved here. Rachel went on to explain to us that the cachet of London was great enough that even her friends from home, who considered au pairs to be servants, were still impressed that she had found a way to be in London. So again, she told us, everybody said, oh, wow, like she lives in London. And some were like, yeah, she's doing this au pairing. And some were like, yeah, she's being a servant in London. But at the same time, people are saying, well, whatever she does, she's in London. As Rachel suggests, the perception of London was an attractive, it was so attractive as a place to live that it actually disguised the nature of au pair work. Many of the au pairs we interviewed described being an au pair like undertaking paid domestic work and often for long hours as a price they were prepared to pay to be in London. When we talked to the hosts about it, they were completely aware that this was going on. They knew it was a buyer's market and that they were getting cheap childcare um, because of the pull of London. One person we interviewed said, what happened when I put in an advert? I had 120 applications in one hour. It's horrible. You put London and everybody wants London. While this host found the competition amongst these au pairs horrible, there are less scrupulous host families which are going to take advantage of this oversupply. And as we saw in the advertisements that we um, analysed from Gumtree, many were offering very, very poor conditions, including really long working hours, such as 67, 60 or 70 hours a week work. When we talked to agencies, real world agencies, they said that they were sure that people would find an au pair to work in those, con those conditions. Another host that we spoke to explained to us how important being in London was in terms of um, providing something that au pairs could have for themselves, particularly if they had a nice place to live that was relatively central. And people quite often advertise au pair um, posts as saying um, zone two or zone three, near, near a park, near a tube. And one host said to us, Childcare is phenomenally expensive, and then so many, so many people want to come to London that what you offer, your spare room, becomes a really valuable thing. The UK then can rely on the pull of London as a highly regarded global city to supply migrants willing to engage in low-paid jobs such as childcare. The specific nature of the UK's deregulated care and migration regimes come together in London to create this massive demand for flexible childcare and a supply of basically unprotected migrant female workers available to do this work. The broader outcomes of this really unregulated buyer's market have been a disintegration of the distinction between au pairs and other domestic workers such as nannies and housekeepers. Au pairs are working long hours, carrying out more arduous work than was traditionally expected. And they're hardly being well paid for the privilege. The even wider outcomes for host families are for, are, are for host families and their employers. Some families are now able to successfully negotiate the demands of home life and paid work in a way they would not be able to without the support of an au pair. And these working parents are able to maintain their long working hours, their flexible work patterns and their long commutes just because they have a spare room in close to no pair. They also never need to renegotiate the unequal balance of reproductive labour because there's just another woman there to do it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rosie. I'm just, I'm just thinking that this is like a, a weird thing that you can't really clap. You don't hear the clap. <laughs> so I'm gonna clap for you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for such a thought-provoking uh, talk and such an interesting research. Um, so um, uh, Sanjay, uh, if, do you wanna come back with your camera? Are you there? Sanjay? Hey.
so we have a, a, a couple of questions already that have been uh, asked, but I'm going to use my privilege as the chair to start with my own uh, questions to, to both of you and, uh, and then some of the questions that have been asked already here. So um, uh, Sanjay first, um, um, uh, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm from Brazil, which is quite a complex country. Uh, and I visit India twice uh, in my life. And when I was there, I was like, oh, this reminds me of home, but it's like as if there was an extra layer of complexity to the Brazilian kind of uh, a context, which I think uh, it relates to the religious kind of aspect of, of, of India, which is less uh, prevalent in Brazil, at least the difference between multiple religions and how they are quite uh, uh, um, important in the making of the society. Uh, and it was really interesting to me when you talked about um, uh, the kind of intersection between gender and religion. And I was quite interested in what you said about the fact that um, uh, the sort of Muslim women identity is being sort of shaped by this experience in public spaces, whereas the Hindu uh, 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 her identity is more connected to, to the sort of like privatized uh, pub, public spaces. So I, I, I wonder if you could talk a bit more about that. And, and also um, uh, if you could sort of talk a bit about why is it that uh, you see so many women in this protest uh, in comparison with, with, with men? Uh, uh, what, what is it about the, uh, the amendment that uh, impacts women in a way that makes them um, um, be more um, engaging more actively in this protest. Um, for for Rosie, I have two uh, questions from um, um, uh, the audience here, which uh, are quite I I think um, about Brexit and about COVID. So how uh, would you think about the situation of OPEs? how the legislation about uh, uh, the movement of all pairs have has been impacted by Brexit or how do you see that affecting the movement of all pairs and, and, and how is COVID-19 affecting? I know that you, you can't really uh, do research on that, but maybe you have some thoughts to share. And, and for me, I was wondering about the kind of like boundaries within the home between when you're working and when you're not working and, 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 and the types of families that uh, are kind of um, um, uh, using the au pair services. Because although au pair might be a bit cheaper than childcare, having a spare room in London, it's a luxury. So uh, I wonder what types of families are using that, that kinds of services. Uh, so, um, and I will invite the audience as well uh, if uh, you'd like to uh, pose some questions. Um, we have a question here from Pankaj. Uh, sorry if I pronounced that not correctly. How does the politics of space in a classless urban society can be looked at from a different perspective when we are discussing social, political, cultural events in a single framework? Um, I don't... I don't think I quite understood that. Pankaj, if you could indicate who the question it, it is for, it would be great. Um, okay, I'll just give you the word now and, 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 and while you're talking, maybe people can um, ask more questions and then I'll, I'll come back with more questions. Do you want to start something? Uh, so, did you want to respond now, Mara? Yeah, yeah, if you can. Ah, one part question will be Okay, I, I can't see myself. Well, that's fine. Okay. Um, just uh, um, uh, quickly, firstly, uh, a quick response to why women in these protests. Um, well, of course, uh, uh, well, you know, obviously it affects one particular community so much. And also, the reasons aren't very clear, but one is that with having uh, women in public protests, I think many of the organizers thought and the women themselves thought that it would be more difficult for the police to be uh, as brutal towards them as they might be towards men. Right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a common 
own police acting. Um, and, but nevertheless, having said that, um, uh, the very act of uh, women from this locality coming out into public spaces and occupying these public spaces, not only in the daytime, but nighttime, itself is a kind of transgression of uh, domesticity that has not happened earlier. Um, and when, when you're saying, uh, you know, and the other question was about why Muslim women in public spaces and why my suggestion that more and more uh, uh, Hindu women are retreating to private spaces. I think that has to do with class, and I'm interested in how class operates in urban space. Um, uh, large numbers of Muslims in India tend to be relatively poor. There is a very, very tiny Muslim middle class as compared to the Hindus. Um, what has happened is that the uh, manufacture of new public spaces, new privately developed public spaces like leisure parks, like gated communities, have largely have tended largely to be occupied by Hindu middle class. Because the race no Muslim middle class that has the capacity to occupy these spaces, number one. And also the the uh, uh, the uh, prevalent discrimination against Muslims means that uh, uh, Muslims tend not to live Occupy spaces where there's Hindu majority. That's the current political atmosphere in Hindu in, in, in India, rather. So class is very uh, very important. The current political atmosphere is very important. Um, the current resurgence of a particular kind of Hindu identity, which is seen as both global but also local and attached to consumerism, and also a genuinely uh, uh, Indian, uh, in exclusion of all other religious identities, is also a particular reason why. Um, uh, uh, Hindu Muslim Hindu uh, religious identities have um, come to occupy those spaces that are seen in Indian, the household, for example, as the whole tradition that this is what India is about. And I think you're right. Many ways, Brazil and India are very similar um, in terms of the informality, for example. And that's a very significant aspect. Um, although uh, different, because I think the um, number of religions competing against each other. Uh, or in conversation with each other in India is much higher, and that produces own dynamic. Um, and uh, I mean, these are some very um, uh, sort of responses. I didn't also quite get the again you asked me the question what was for, and I'll wait in terms of the politics of space and how you look at it in this one framework. So I'll leave it there. And my presentation is really sort of more about questions about how do we think about women who come from very traditional backgrounds negotiating within the household to be present in the public space with other women um, uh, producing domesticity in public space, that is Hindu women. So th this is more about questions rather than necessarily any, any definitive answers. Thank you, Sanjay. I have a follow-up question about uh, script later. Rosie, do you want to go? Sure. No? I'm, I'll answer your questions first because they're probably useful background to um, everybody else. So the, the first one was who employs au pairs? And in general, yes, mm -hmm. it probably is better off more middle class families. But mm -hmm. we also came across quite people who were not very well off at all, including people who live in um, um, public housing, council housing, um, who are hosting au pairs, nurses quite often, um, people who work shifts. Um, so it, it's not necessarily people who are on high incomes and not everybody provides their au pair with their own room. So we came across au pairs who were expected to sleep on the sofa, who were expected to share a room with the children, that kind of thing. So it's there's a very great range, but there's it's not necessarily just people who are well off. The question of boundaries in the home is massive. It's really important. And it's one of the ways in which the relationship between the au pair and the host is made. So quite often the boundaries between the, spa the spaces that the au pair and the family use are policed really hard. So the au pair is told when you've finished your duties for the day, when you've cleaned the kitchen and done the washing up, you go to your room. We don't want you to watch TV with us. You're not part of the family. And quite often au pairs will work out what sort of a family it is by asking questions about that kind of thing. 
oh, you know, would you expect me to watch TV with you and the kids in the evening? Would you expect me to eat with you? And if they're told yes or no, they know what the relationship is going to be like. So the, 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 the boundaries within the home are used to negotiate the relationship and produce the relationship. And they make a massive difference to people because if they get that match wrong, if somebody wants to be close and they get distant, they're miserable both, both sides round. Um, in terms of the questions about Brexit and COVID, um, it's quite hard to answer because there's no research on either of these things. The government has not yet released guidance about what it's going to do to allow OPEDs into the country when freedom of movement finishes. Um, there's a general feeling that they like forgetting about au pairs, which is how they ended up not being ha having any um, protections in the first place. But there's um, a campaign going called Save the Au Pairs, which is organised by agencies and things to try and get some kind of visa introduced. And that's probably what will happen. But along with um, lots of other people from um, Eastern European countries in particular, but also any other European countries, after the Brexit referendum, people just stopped wanting to come to Britain because it just didn't seem like a very welcoming place. And so if you have a choice, you might want to go somewhere else instead. You might want to go to the US. You might want to go to um, one of the Nordic countries, which have quite well paid au pairing schemes. And Britain stopped seeing quite as um, inviting. So those huge numbers of applications for each au pair role, they started to drop. The roles are still getting filled, but we don't have 100 people looking for each one now. In terms of COVID, I only know grapevine things, but around the world there's been a massive issue about how live-in domestic, well, all domestic workers, but live-in domestic workers in particular, have been treated during um, the, the outbreak. Because depending on whether they are expected to stay isolated with the families that they're living with, or whether they're meant to leave, that makes a really um, big difference in terms of how they're, how they're treated and the, the chances of them being protected. I was um, approached by a group of au pairs who um, were trying to um, get some form of protection because they had two friends already who had been kicked out of the houses they were living in because they'd started coughing. So this was at the beginning of the outbreak. These are, this was a group of Spanish au pairs and um, they were just chucked out on the street, like in one go, You're, uh, you, you know, I'm not endangering my children's lives, is what they were told. And we've seen that with domestic workers around the world, that if they seem to have any problems with their health, they, they're expected to leave. But they're also, if they're healthy, they're expected to stay and to continue the, to do their work, even if that means that they're not able to isolate. So there's it's a really, really important question, but we don't really have data on it yet. Yeah, yeah. I wonder as well, like, um, um, not a question, but just like a comment that for the, 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 the people that don't have great relationships with the families that they're hosting them, the kind of like environment that you, you get from not being able to, to socialize outside the home would be uh, quite um, um, suffocating, right? Um, so uh, we have a couple of more questions from uh, from the audience here, uh, from Tanuja for for Sanjay. Uh, if uh, is there a caste dimension in relation to emerging public spaces in London, uh, in Delhi? Sorry, not London, Delhi. Um, and uh, I also wanted to kind of like follow up a little bit on on um, on what what you were saying before. And uh, although I know that your work has been uh, mainly focused in Delhi, I was wondering if there is a kind of like a regional difference um, uh, in, in, in India about uh, both the, the sort of like the, the, the Citizenship Amendment Act and the reaction to it, and also about this kind of um, uh, gender roles. If, if Delhi, uh, how does it compare to other regions of, of, of India in relation to how uh, patriarchal uh, the society in Delhi East. Um, and for you, um, Rosie, there is a question from Rebecca. So uh, she's saying, uh, gender roles are greatly, greatly affected by the built environment. Uh, so do you think that the deregulated presence of au pairing as a solution for childcare lessens the requirement for demands on the built environment with respect to gender mainstreaming? 
So I guess it's a, it's a, it's a question about uh, sort of like the, the regulation of all peri in comparison with uh, aspects more of urban planning uh, and gender main, mainstreaming. Uh, and she's then adding that it's not just about a, a pairing, but perhaps also in relation to reproductive care in the UK, uh, more generally speaking. Uh, so, um, um, Sanjay, if you wanna, I think you. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I think there is a significant cast I mentioned, and, I, and it's a link to the class I mentioned. I think what's happened in terms of gender uh, is the. Uh, refashioning of, you know, if I'm thinking about caste and class, and I think both should be taken together, is a refashioning of what is now considered or uh, the making of the ordinary person. Historically, in most post-colonial societies, it was the poor, the poor person who was the ordinary person, the so-called lower caste person discriminated, discriminated against who was the uh, ordinary person. Increasingly, I think what's happened in the last couple of decades is the refashioning of this no notion of who the ordinary person is. Just as in Trump's America, you have many white people saying, I've been discriminated against, I am the ordinary person. I think what's happened in India is many upper caste people and, uh, are now saying that actually historically the state has only looked after the, the lower caste people and the poor. We are also ordinary people and we also need to be looked after. And that also bleeds into gender. So upper casteness, uh, caste dimension, and gender and the presentation by women, upper caste women, as also discriminated against is a very significant way in which um, gender itself is being refashioned in cities because the notion of who the ordinary or the common person is being is being refashioned around the world, I think. And so you can see that in, in, in India, the notion that, that, that we are also victims, the notion of taking on a victimhood, um, whereas 20, 30 years ago, you wouldn't have thought that people structurally higher up in the hierarchy would see themselves as victimhood. So because the idea of victimhood is being refashioned, the idea of ordinariness, ordinariness is being refashioned, there's very strong Kaiser to caste dimension in terms of how upper caste women see themselves as ordinary Indians, doing ordinary things like religious practices and, and tradition and looking after the home, etc. And these being the ordinary common practices that people need to follow. That's one way of kind of very, maybe not uh, trying to answer it very quickly. Regionally, I think I would divide, um, not Delhi, but North India with other parts of the country. I think there are very specific differences because North India has not seen the same kind of um, anti patriarchal I feel like, as South India. It's Conservative society and it continues to be in terms of the politics of masculinity a much more conservative region as compared to Western India or South India. So it's public spaces in, in North India, where Delhi is located, tend to be much more masculine than public spaces in Western India, Southern India, where there's been a history of um, what are known as kind of social social reform movements, if you like, against certain forms of publicness, whether it has to do with caste, whether it has to do with gender. So I would certainly say that North India is um, a specific case where masculinity politics, the older structures of uh, patriarchy continue to be much more um, strongly uh, 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 around, seem to be much more embedded than in other parts of the country. And that would certainly influence any analysis that you do um, uh, in terms of regionally specific analyses of uh, gender, of caste, and, and cities. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Again, I have a follow-up question, but I'll, I'll leave that to you. <laughs> uh, Rosie, do you want to uh, give it a go? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Rebecca, for this question. Um, it's a great question. Um, I also think you answered it yourself. Um, because, <laughs> you know, because you're completely right that um, gender roles are greatly affected by the built environment. And the built environment is greatly affected by what we think gender roles are and should be. And Yes, you do see that. I mean, you do see the entirety of our reproductive regime written into urban space. If there was a belief that it should be easy for somebody to drop their child at collective childcare and, and get to work and, um, you know, be able to do that in an affordable manner and live in decent housing, then more of that would be written on the urban landscape. 
for childcare would be nearer to home or maybe to work, the public transport would go where you needed it to go to or and maybe be designed so that you could fit your um, twin baby buggy in it slightly easier, whatever the thing is. And the, um, the timing of all the things that needs to happen in order to accomplish various different forms of reproductive labour would also be made into that space. And we know this because not all cities are the, are the same. So yes, um, it's, yes, definitely um, our built environment reflects the fact that we think that a family is a particular thing, that it has responsibilities for a particular thing, that it's different and separate somehow from something called work, which happens somewhere else, and that it's going to solve this problem for itself. Um, and hopefully that won't always be the case, but at the moment that is what we see. Yeah, and then in regards to that, like going back a little bit to the sort of like COVID-19 uh, thing, like what we are seeing now with uh, women um, uh, working from home and doing the childcare uh, uh, while still working from home. Uh, it's quite an interesting thing. I, I mean, you, you've seen the, the, the report showing how, for instance, uh, uh, submissions to journals uh, by women, single authored um, uh, uh, articles has kind of like decreased, whereas single authored uh, submissions by men have increased. Like, Kind of like ideas now. Who takes care of the of the of the care <laughs> work uh, when we can't use like we can't access these other these other services, right? Um, that's a quite an interesting uh, discussion. Um, uh, do we have any more questions from the audience? I'm looking here. At least I can't see. Uh, it's a bit different from a sort of like. Um, I guess at this point, I would sort of suggest like let's uh, have some wine and have like informal conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so we could have questions. I'm having some tea because I thought, <laughs> you know, I was trying to think wasn't a great idea. Um, um, but I guess uh, if we don't have any more questions, I was wondering if you two have questions for each other as well, which would be sort of like um, uh, an interesting way to finish. Uh, oh, we do have a mo one more question. But I mean, if you do have questions for each other, do, do ask them. But for Sanjay, uh, where are these protests taking place? How does this distance affect how they are received and how spaces are reformed? Um, so. uh, do you want me to respond? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the, so the, these protests were taking place on the 24th of March when, um, because of the COVID uh, uh, episode, um, there were the protesters uh, agreed to move. Um, they were taking place in a, a locality in east of Delhi, which is a Muslim uh, dom, um, uh, Muslim majority area. Um, uh, a lot of the media was um, the, the, the main um, uh, discourse around Muslim women coming into public spaces. A lot of the public discourse was, of course, about um, the fact that um, uh, uh, that this is this is not what Muslim women should be doing. That this was, as they said, it was anti-national. Uh, it was against the interests of the nation state. Um, many of the kind of shock jock television shows certainly uh, presented Muslims um, uh, in even more kind of stigmatized terms than, than, than has been the case of the last uh, six, seven years. Um, wh whereas the, uh, there was another discourse which actually uh, uh, talked about the, the, the possibilities of new forms of domestic no negotiation within Muslim households. For um, uh, Muslim women to negotiate within the household, to be present in public spaces, different times of the day, different times of the uh, night, and also to engage in ideas of what the state should be like, what the nation state should be like, what the constitution should be like, what is what, what are human rights, um, and, and and to be present in public spaces while doing this. Whereas, whereas I think uh, a very large uh, there was an alternative discourse that I was saying, which actually further said we stigmatize the women as people who are out of place, people who are ungrateful, because after all, as the discourse went, the Muslims in India are treated far better than, say, Muslims in Pakistan. So there were two parallel um, narratives. 
Um, but certainly, I think it, it remains to be seen. Some of the more interesting questions are about um, uh, 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 the negotiations that happened between the women who came out to protest and, and the households. And, and it certainly changes the nature of public spaces in cities such as Delhi, which historically has been quite hostile to women's presence, certainly at night, and to women's articulation engagement with uh, ideas of the state and ideas of human rights. Uh, so some of these issues are to be explored and certainly um, interest in between class and gender, and Hindu public and the Muslim public, and what a city, how a city produces these publics. I'm wondering, I mean, just like a final question to both of you. Uh, uh, in your talk, you were talking about, about the sort of like the modernizing aspect of, of English society and the sort of like rapid, rapid urbanization that the society is experiencing. And, and I was wondering how uh, you make compatible the society's kind of reproducing gender, uh, uh, norms. Uh, in the context of like urbanization or modernization, uh, sort of like how how uh, if those things are in somehow um, in conflict, or if they get a sort of like somehow re um, reassembled in a sort of like a different way. Um, I guess like the question is how urbanization and modernization is affecting gender patriarchal norms. And for you, Rosie, I was just wondering, like, uh, yeah. thinking a bit about uh, the new work that you're doing on, on uh, male uh, reproductive labor. If you can share a bit of, uh, of what you've been finding uh, in that new research, that kind of like perhaps the conversation of what you've uh, researched before, how, how this kind of like relates with the discussion that, that we are having. Um, and I guess. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. So um, I think what's happened is I think um, you know sort of a not a unilineal kind of uh, movement from less to sort of more to less patriarchy, but uh, I think but within consumer cultures, I'm here really interested in urban context and consumer cultures. Um, I think there's a reformulation and recalibration of different forms of uh, structures of power, so which is where I was using the term moral consumption. So increasingly, there's a politics of heritage in India, right? Um, politics of Hindu heritage. We have globalization, and yet what is that is genuinely ours, which always will remain ours and fundamentally Indian, irrespective of the fact that things are being globalized. And that's where I think moral consumption comes in, because Consumerism, especially in cities, is something that invites everyone to be a part, right? When and men and women. And yet, um, it also has a potential to undermine certain longer other structures. So we, women become consumers, um, as happened, say, uh, early 20th century Europe. They, they also spend on themselves. Right? They're no longer the self-sacrificing idea of the woman. And that creates a problem in terms of structural patriarchy. So on the one hand, no one does not want more consumption. How do you manage that idea that within consumption, women may present as more autonomous because you're spending on yourself? I think what idea, what the idea of moral consumption does is it presents a notion that women can be both hyper consumers, but when required, they can come back home. By home, I mean symbolically to tradition, to religion, etc., etc. I think that's what's happening in many societies undergoing such change. The notion that a kind of heritage politics where women, no one does not want more consumption. But how do you manage it, I put it in inverted, inverted commas, within structures of uh, existing structures so that women do not become sort of completely autonomous? How do you actually manage that problem of patriarchy, that problem of existing structures? And you manage it through having cases where women can be both. You can be both of the world, but also simultaneously or concurrently, if you like, of home. You come back home when it's required. So that's one way of managing, I think. So I don't think it's kind of necessarily a movement from, I mean, sort of less to more autonomy. But I think it's a little bit more complex of, of, of managing autonomy um, uh, within the existing context of patriarchy and masculinity, but also allowing those things which seem to undermine 
uh, patriarchy and masculinity. I don't think so. Consumerism for me, in many senses, really poses a problem, but also provides an answer. It's a choice. You can have both the world and not the home. So it's kind of ironically, I think consumerism provides both a problem of too much autonomy, but also that context where you can have a choice. You can have both. And that is, of course, what consumerism is about. So that's one way I would say that I would, I would try and answer this question in somewhat one uh, sort of a meandering manner. Thank you, Sanjay. That was great. <laughs> that was so easy. <laughs> 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 it's just really interesting. Just think about everything I know about the, the growth of consumption. Um, it, it, yeah, like in the early 20th century and in the 1950s, and the and suburban US, and how that totally structures, you know, the idea of the housewife. And yeah, so this is it's just really fascinating thinking about that in a new um, in a context yeah. I, I, I don't know, you know. So, in, so in the US context, we could have both the kitchen, but also a kitchen for fancy new fridges and whatever. Yeah. So you can have. Yeah. Sorry. And there's a really interesting um, argument um, that the figure of the housewife, um, it, it, the, the post-war housewife, and her role as a consumer, was the first moment in, um, well, particularly kind of um, ang the Anglophone West, where women from both working class and middle class families had a shared identity. And it was only at that point in time with that, that really group shared identity that the possibility for the feminist movement emerged because the figure of the housewife gave women a shared identity that could then be built on to develop second wave feminism. Whereas previous to that, the interests of working class women who were largest single group domestic workers and middle class women, their employers, didn't line up in the same way. So it's just, you know, such a, a kind of fascinating kind of nexus on which lots of these things turn. Um, that wasn't the question you asked me. <laughs> but so um, I started doing research about um, men who are paid to substitute for traditional male labour in the home because I was really interested to see, is it gender that um, brings with it low wages, um, the um, disregard for skill, informality, all the rest of it. So it was like my thought experiment. If I hold everything else the same and change gender, what happened to the conditions of work? Um, it wasn't the world's most successful thought experiment because life is really complicated and um, in all sorts of ways, um, the work on the physical properties of your home are not the same as um, childcare and they're not necessarily the same as routine housework. But one of the things I found was that in, um, I did research in um, New Zealand and, um, and I've looked at the UK as well. And in the UK, there was really, really similar trends underpinning the employment of handymen as there are to nannies and au pairs and things. So people wanting quality time, then working very long hours, not feeling like they have free time to work on their houses themselves. And when they do have free time, they don't want to spend it doing housework, which is exactly what people say about why they employ, um, uh, for example, cleaners. So cleaners, when people are asked uh, why they employ them, to stop the arguments, and because I don't have a lot of time, and the time I have, I want to spend doing nice things. And that was very much what people said about employing um, handyman labour. Another thing that was interesting was that migrant handymen were often working in circumstances which were incredibly similar to what we see migrant domestic workers working in. So um, in jobs which were considered to be unskilled, very low paid, in the informal sector, really precarious and quite often really dangerous. Um, some of the handymen were homeless, um, living in squats or tents, earning really small amounts of money, 30, 40 pounds a day. On the other hand, people who'd been in the country for longer, particularly um, people who were born in Britain, were able to use the idea of skill and to be treated um, as skilled kind of tradespeople and um, to be paid more for doing um, similar work. And that both groups could mobilise um, 
national stereotypes um, in order to create the conditions of their work. So particularly Polish men, that they're very capable, that any Polish man can do these things, you don't need a special person. And that British men, that they were kind of like respectable and um, solid um, and were always going to be there. Although, to be honest, people generally thought that British people were terrible and unreliable. So, but, so the national stereotypes were really important, but they, the comparisons were, were worth making, um, but not simple. Yeah, so uh, it seems like in order to avoid discussions at home, men and women hire like a, the handyman and the and the nanny kind of like and keep the kind of gender inequality unchanged within the home. <laughs> uh, okay, I think uh, uh, that's it. Um, we uh, it's almost seven thirty. We've had a uh, very very interesting discussion. Thank both of you for for you. coming and for accepting the. the event uh, and thanks for all of the people that joined us today as well and especially thank you for I'm just going to repeat William who is behind the scenes there helping us uh, set up everything so uh, and have a great evening and I hope that uh, we can uh, keep on this conversation going until sort of a, you know gender features is a, is a better uh, sort of a subject to, to, to talk about. Uh, more pleasant, let's say. <laughs> but um, uh, that's it for me, and thank you very much.